Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to address the Commission on the Status of Women. We meet for a second time in the context of the pandemic, which is having a devastating impact on women and girls. COVID-19 is a crisis with a woman's face. The fallout has shown how deeply gender inequality remains embedded in the world's political, social, and economic systems. Those disparities have themselves exacerbated the damage, and we have all paid the price. Women make up 70% of the world's healthcare workforce and occupy most of the jobs in the economic sectors that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Compared to men, women are 24% more likely to lose their jobs and can expect their income to fall 50% more steeply. Women's and girls' unpaid work has risen dramatically owing to stay-at-home orders, the closure of schools and childcare facilities, increased elder care, and so much else. The pandemic has also sparked a shadow epidemic of violence against women worldwide, both online and offline. Every month, the toll rises, from sexual abuse to child marriage. The damage is incalculable and will resound down the decades into future generations. Now is the time to change course. Women's equal participation is the game changer we need. Decades of evidence show that women's participation enhances economic results, prompts greater investment in social protection, leads to more sustainable peace and advances climate action. Now it is the COVID-19 response that has spotlighted the great power of women's leadership. Over the past year, women leaders are among those who have kept transmission rates low and put countries on track for recovery. Women's organizations have filled crucial gaps in the provision of services and information, especially at the community level. Greater gender balance has led to better responses. Conversely, countries with less effective responses have tended to be those where strong men approaches prevail and women's rights are under assault. The United Nations has uh, positioned women at the heart of its initiatives to combat COVID-19 and to achieve a recovery. We have been amongst the first to publish an assessment of the impact of the pandemic on women. We have called for recovery measures to be adopted to buttress the informal economy, to invest in the care economy, and to target female entrepreneurs. And we have collaborated with public authorities and with civil society and other uh, populaces to address the uptick of violence targeting women specifically by seeing to it that uh, that housing uh, and other accommodations remain open and organizing the transfer of existing services online. My call for a, cease, a global ceasefire was immediately followed by a call for an end to domestic violence. Beyond that, we have taken every opportunity to emphasize the, the effectiveness of women's participation on equal footing with men. Yet, if we take a look at the situation worldwide, it is evident that women are largely excluded from the exercise of the highest responsibility. Women only account for one quarter of parliamentarians, one third of elected local leaders, and one fifth of ministers globally. Only 25 nations are led by women. At the current pace, parity at the level of heads of governments will only be reached in 2150. You have heard correctly, another 130 years dominated by men who will take the same decisions, the same kind of decisions that they have taken over the past 130 years, the same decisions that have perennially been taken. The pandemic offers men another opportunity to seize the levers of decision making. According to a study focusing on 87 countries, 80 5% of a working groups on COVID-19 were largely comprised of men. If we consider global media coverage uh, focused on the pandemic, experts, uh, female experts are consulted. Uh, fe one 
out of every five times that male experts are ex ex are consulted, there's a need to address this imbalance when women do not participate in decision making. We only see the world through one angle. We create economic models that do not assess and measure the productive work that takes place at home. We create a digital fora with masculine bias, which is incorporated into their very code. And we see decisions taken that threatened efforts undertaken to ensure equitable access to health and reproductive services. And we expend billions of dollars on weapons that do not protect people better while neglecting violence endured by one out of every three women worldwide. There's a need to shuffle, reshuffle the deck to shift this situation. For this reason, one of my top priorities as Secretary General was to increase the number of women in senior positions and at my senior management group, as well as among resident coordinators and uh, special envoys. Last year, we achieved the gender parity among the senior representatives. And this was two years ahead of schedule. And we are now making headway at all levels. We are also striving to ensure women's full participation in the uh, peacekeeping process, in mediation, and in peace building. However, there is tremendous work that lies ahead in peace negotiations between 1992 and 2019, only 13% of negotiators. 6% of mediators and 6% of uh, the signatories of peace accords were women. Still, today, these negotiations are structured in such a way as uh, to applaud and even encourage individuals who fuel violence rather than those individuals who build peace. Excellencies, too often when addressing the challenge of exclusion, it is suggested that we focus on training, capacity building, empowerment for women. But women already have the skills, the expertise, and the capacity. In many countries, they are graduating from higher education at higher rates than men, and they've been for some time. What you need is not more training for women, but to train those in power on how to build inclusive institutions. We need to move beyond fixing women and instead fix our systems. We must also support women leaders in all their diversity and abilities, including young women, migrant women, indigenous women, women with disabilities, women of color, and LGBTIQ+. Pandemic recovery is our chance to engineer a reset, reignite the decade of action for the Sustainable Development Goals, and chart a path to an equal future for women and men. I call on all leaders to put in place five key building blocks. First, realize women's equal rights fully, including by repealing discriminatory laws and enacting positive measures. Second, ensure equal representation from company boards to parliaments, from higher education to public institutions through special measures, including quotas. Third, to advance women's economic inclusion through equal pay, targeted credit, job protection, and significant investments in the care economy and social protection. Fourth, to enact an emergency response plan in each country to address violence against women and girls and follow through with funding, policies, and political will. And fifth, to give space to the intergenerational transition that is underway. From the front lines to online, young women are advocating for a more just and equal world and merit greater support. This year, we have an opportunity to advance this agenda through the Generation Equality Forum and action coalitions being convened by the UN Women, co-hosted by the governments of Mexico and France in partnership with civil society and youth. Excellencies, gender equality is essentially a question of power. We still live in a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture. And this must change. And males are an essential part of the solution. This commission will continue to play a central role in shifting mindsets, calling out systemic bias, and mobilizing tangible, meaningful action. Earlier this year, we lost an inspiring leader of this shared cause. Margaret Snyder, 
the founding director of UNIFEM, and an ally of women's groups across the world. Last year, reflecting on the early years of her efforts and the obstacles she faced, she wrote, and I quote, through all of the administrative issues, we were reminded that working to empower the poorest women was threatening to some high level and powerful people. They could move us, but they couldn't stop us. End of quote. Together, you are an unstoppable force. Together, we have a chance to leave behind entrenched exclusion and build a just and equal future. Let's make it happen together, and I thank you.